Okay, welcome to our first uh, pre-class video lecture on the fundamental attribution error and science. And uh, this class, research methods, is generally described as being a process class or not a content class. Uh, and I'm going to mention that the first day of class also uh, to prepare you for it. It's a very different class than you've been taking. You've been taking content-based classes. Abnormal psychology is a course about abnormal psychology. Uh, social psychology is a course about social psychology. Physiological psychology is a course about physiological psychology. Research methods is a course about doing psychology. It's not about any topic or any type of content. There is course information to learn, but mainly it's going to be information to be applied. And so in general, people say that research methods is a content-free course. And over the years of teaching research methods, I realized that teaching it totally content-free is not going to really help students. Uh, because as a professor, and I have experience with all these different content areas, uh, that serves as a backdrop to understanding the processes that we're talking about in research methods. But I know to students, uh, it may not be uh, that clear. So what I'm going to do is just briefly touch on one theory and one phenomena in psychology, the fundamental attribution error, and I'm going to use it as a backdrop to uh, what we're talking about in the course. So if I'm going to do that, uh, we need to talk, start talking about what this fundamental attribution error is. And uh, I'm not going to really clearly define it for you today in this lecture, because uh, later on this week uh, we're going to start to do some readings uh, where you'll start to define it yourself and come to understand it yourself. And you'll also get to, in you know, terms of you know, the context of research methods, see examples of different types of research articles uh, that we use. So uh, I'm going to introduce you today to just one aspect of the fundamental attribution error of this phenomena. And it goes back to the Gulf War in 1991. Uh, which was a war between mainly the United States and a coalition of UN-backed uh, nations uh, against Iraq. And at that point, Iraq had a huge army and air force, and it took about one month of air battles for the coalition forces to destroy or you know, effectively degrade the uh, anti-aircraft and uh, air force of the Iraq uh, you know, army. But during that month, a lot of American uh, pilots and coalition pilots were shot down over Iraq. And fortunately, most of them were able to eject and survived ejecting. But they were captured by the Iraqis. And uh, the Iraqis uh, uh, put many of these on TV and had them read statements or make statements. And so let's take a look at Prisoner A. Here's a, a Prisoner A, uh, which I believe is an American pilot, and uh, Prisoner A's statement on the video, uh, which was on Iranian TV, was, I have a very good family back home. I love them, miss them. I'm afraid I might not ever see them again. I love them, and I'd like to be able to hug them again. So, uh, with Prisoner A, I want you to think about these two questions. We're going to start to do a thought experiment. To what extent were Prisoner A's statements forced by his captors? No force at all to, uh, you know, totally forced. What number would you give, uh, you know, how much uh, Prisoner A's uh, statements were forced by his captor? And if you want, stop the video and go back and reread uh, his statements. And then the other question is, what was Prisoner A's personal attitude towards the Gulf War? Was it zero, totally anti-war, 50, neither for or against the war, or 100, totally pro-war? Now let's look at Prisoner B, uh, another American aviator. He says, I think our leaders and our people have wrongly attacked the peaceful people of Iraq. I fly the A-6 intruder. My mission was to att attack the H-3 airfield in southwest Iraq. And again, 
Uh, to what extent do you think prisoner B's statements were forced by his captors? Zero, no force at all, or 100, totally forced. And again, what do you think prisoner B's personal attitude towards the Gulf War was? Uh, zero, 50, 100. I ask you those questions because back uh, during the war, Fleming and Scott, two psychologists, did this study. They had 80 undergraduates uh, watch the videos uh, of POWs, and they formed two groups of videos of POWs. One group, or one condition, was POWs who uh, you know, had an anti-war statement, such as Prisoner B. And Prisoner B's videotape was actually used by Fleming and Scott. And then the other group was uh, those videos without anti-war statements, such as Prisoner A. And as we did, their dependent variables uh, were you know, an estimation that the belief uh, that the statement was coerced and attributions of the POW's attitudes about the war. And first off, what they found uh, for the coercion dependent variable is that they felt that the uh, POWs, that is the subjects in that experiment, felt the POWs uh, with the anti-war statement, like Prisoner B, they, they were more coerced than prisoners without an anti-war statement. So think about that. That is, Prisoner B, the subjects felt he was forced, maybe at gunpoint, uh, to uh, say this statement. Whereas the statement made by Prisoner A was more or less based on that prisoner's own free will or desires. And then when they looked at the measure of uh, their attitudes towards the war, what they found was that uh, Prisoner B and the other prisoners who uh, read an anti-war statement, they attributed a personal belief that was more anti-war uh, to uh, those prisoners than the prisoners who did not read an anti-war statement. So again, uh, Prisoner B, who said he was against the war, I don't know why we're attacking the peace-loving, peaceful people of Iraq, uh, you know, uh, they assumed that what he said reflected his own personal beliefs. And that last difference, that's the fundamental attribution error, that people will take people's uh, statements or behaviors at face value and use it as diagnostic of what they really believe. And indeed what was going on was people would focus on that one statement, I think our leaders and our people have wrongly attacked the peaceful people of Iraq, and they will take that statement at face value, assume that this was the person's personal opinion, and believe that. Uh, and that is, if you think about it, kind of odd because all of those prisoners were prisoners of war and uh, they were under armed guard uh, as you could tell they were beaten uh, and all of those prisoners had machine guns pointed at them when they were reading these statements that were written to uh, written for them by the Iraqis and think about that and we'll of course look at the fundamental attribution error uh, more broadly uh, in the next couple of weeks but the fundamental attribution error is, uh, you know, you know, uh, very much in the realm of folk psychology that uh, the textbook talks about in chapter one. Uh, folk psychology is defined as the intuitive beliefs about people's behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. And intuitive, if you look it up in the dictionary, uh, is defined as using or based on what one feels to be true even without conscious reasoning. It's instinctive. That is, you just feel that this is the right thing to uh, conclude about a situation. And this uh, folk psychology or this intuitive beliefs about things that people have, some are accurate, but some are inaccurate. And uh, psychologists and social psychologists have been focusing on what is accurate and what is inaccurate. The textbook talks about the confirmation bias as one of these inaccuracies of intuitive thinking or folk beliefs, and the fundamental attribution error is very similar to this, and definitely uh, part of folk psychology and inaccurate uh, use of intuitive thinking about other people. 
And in contrast to folk psychology, we could make conclusions about other people using science. And one of the key, or three of the key elements of science is first off, it's systematic empiricism. Uh, and systematic means that we're, we're uh, applying the same procedure when we collect information from everybody. So going back to Fleming and Scott's study, they used the same procedure when they collected information from everyone. Uh, that is, they showed people a set of videos, then they had them answer those two questions on that scale. They didn't change that method from one group to another. They didn't halfway through the study improve upon it or change it for whatever reason. They stuck with the same uh, method for everyone. And if you think about it, if we start to change the method that we use to collect data halfway through the collection, that really isn't fair to uh, you know, people or to the truth that we're trying to find in that we're you know, changing the goals halfway through the process. And also in that term, systematic empiricism is the term empiricism. Empiricism means information based on observation or based on data. That is, we're not using our intuition, we're using our eyes and we're collecting data or information from our senses. And so that's what empiricism means. Another element of science that the textbook defines is empirical questions. And they're really getting at, uh, you know, the textbook is really getting at the idea that we ask about what people do, not what they ought to do. Uh, that is, I study in some parts of my research uh, sexual assault, that is rape. And I'm interested in studying exactly what people think about rape victims and rapists and how culpable or how guilty or how blameworthy they are for what happened to them. And indeed, I asked subjects in some experiments, how responsible do you think a rape victim was for being raped? And this is a great example of these empirical questions and that I'm interested in finding out what people do. That is, do people blame rape victims for being raped? And that's a very, very different question uh, from should rape victims, ought they, be blamed for being raped? The answer, of course, is no, they shouldn't. They're a victim of a crime. But even though that's morally true and what ought to happen, people actually do blame rape victims for being raped. And so that's what uh, the idea of empirical questions is getting at. And then finally, science chooses public knowledge, and that's really focusing on the empiricism part. That is, the way that we know something truly is empirical is that different people can look at it, see it, and recognize it's exactly the same thing. Uh, so, for example, an example of this public uh, knowledge in Scott and Fleming's study is that they used a 1 to 100 scale. Uh, to get data from their subjects. So when you ask the subjects, to what extent do you think this uh, POW's uh, you know, statement was coerced? And they write down 59. Now, I can look at that piece of paper and see that it's a 59, and I can show it to you, and you can see that it's 59. And that's what we mean by public knowledge. Uh, it could be either a public act of like circling a number on a questionnaire, writing down something on a questionnaire, or doing a physical behavior that we both can see and both can agree upon that happened. That is, does somebody touch their nose? How many times does somebody touch their nose during a five minute period? And I can look at somebody and I, like a videotape of someone and I can count the number of times they touch their nose, and I can say they touched their nose five times. And you know, you can say, well, did they really? And I said, well, yeah, here's the videotape. You watch it and see if you agree with me, and you watch it and say, yeah, they actually did touch it five times. Uh, and that's what we mean by public knowledge. So these three elements, systematic empiricism, empirical questions, and public knowledge, this is the, uh, the foundation of what science is. And then the textbook talks about different types of scientific research, basic research and applied research. Basic research is 
uh, primarily for the sake of achieving a more detailed and accurate understanding of the phenomena of the human behavior, and not necessarily interested in practical problems. But applied research is the complete opposite in that it's more interested in addressing practical problems. And my research on sexual assault you know, has been basic and applied. In some situations, I'm interested in basic ideas about understanding human behavior in this situation. That is, how do people blame the victim and how do people blame the transgressor in an accident? And so in some of my studies, which have been very much basic research, I've been looking at and asking subjects to you know, look at a situation where there's been a car accident. And I asked them about how you know, responsible the victim was and how responsible the transgressor was. But then in other applied air experiments I've done, I've actually looked at the practical problem of why people blame rape victims for being raped. And that's a very, you know, very definite practical problem. Because as I always tell my students, uh, you know, it's practical in that answering that question could be immediately used by people in the legal system. Uh, for example, prosecuting attorneys when they're dealing with jurors who are making uh, attributions about the guilt of a rapist and, a, and the blameworthiness of a rape victim. And to the degree to which jurors will make those attributions will determine whether or not they find a rapist guilty or not. And so as you can see, there's very direct practical issues there. And I believe, oh, one final slide here. And this is, and I need to find my pointer. Where's my pointer? Is that a pointer? Nah, laser pointer. Uh, this is the model of scientific research, or the research cycle, uh, that the textbook shows us. And it begins with a research question, and then the researcher looks at the research literature, and then goes back and modifies their research question. So research questions are developed by making informal observations about you know, uh, people or practical problems, and then taking that idea and looking at the literature and seeing what the literature says, the research literature says about that problem. And then uh, conducting an empirical study, analyzing the data, making conclusions, and then publishing that so it becomes part of the research literature, which somebody else will use to form a new research question. So it truly is a cycle. And uh, I'll give you an example. For example, my research on uh, you know, sexual assault uh, and attributions uh, began you know, about uh, 25 years ago when a student was interested uh, in the idea of uh, you know, looking at rape victims. And she had a very specific focus. And so what we did was we looked at the research literature and we found one part of the research literature, an article on uh, attributions and, uh, uh, you know, beliefs about how much somebody uh, suffered in terms of objective damages. And we combined those two into a research question. And we conducted the study, we analyzed the data, we made conclusions, and we presented that research uh, at a conference. So that's an example of the research cycle. And uh, you can, uh, you know, to uh, continue on thinking about the research cycle, think about uh, any experiment, including, uh, you know, Fleming and Scott's experiment, and uh, thinking about how they apply the research cycle. All right, so I'll see you in class.